Thank you, sir. I am here to report that the name of Jesus will still do everything that it, that it uh, originally would do. The, the, everything that it will always do. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Last night... Um, we kind of, you know what happens when you get a bunch of preachers together? Um, they uh, had me close the service last night, and uh, I think I actually absolutely shocked my wife because I only preached about 10 minutes. <clears throat> But I followed a guy that had come from Oklahoma. I might have preached 15, I don't know. But anyway, I followed a guy that had come from Oklahoma, and he came to that conference for an answer. Because two months ago, the doctor told him he had six months to live. And he's a pastor, and he believes that the name of Jesus will touch every, to heal everything that it touches. Gave him six months to live because they told him he had an incurable disease. And you know, the Lord had told me to have uh, Carol Hogner sing just between this pastor and, and I. And uh, she sang nothing but the blood. And he got healed. This guy this guy's sings and preaches. But he hasn't been able to sing for several months because he's been so short of breath. Uh, and uh, while she was singing nothing but the blood... A prophet came out of the back and he touched this guy and that guy took off running. And I have no idea how many laps around that building he ran, but the prophet runs smooth out of breath who was a man that was 20 years younger than him and said, you got to slow down, I can't keep up. And he just kept on going and going and going. And uh, then when he got done and he sat down, after I got done, he got a guitar and he sang for about an hour afterwards. And so he uh, completely and totally was healed by the name of Jesus and by the blood of Jesus. And uh, so it was, uh, it was an awesome time. He went home today to... Uh, he was supposed to stop on the way through Oklahoma City and tell him whether he'd take a lung transplant or not. He says, uh, last night his testimony was this. He says, the Lord spoke to me a little earlier today. He said, somebody has to die for you to get lungs, and I already did that. Amen. So, uh, take your Bible. Turn to Matthew chapter 9. I want to talk about the finished work of the cross. I just did talk about the finished work of the cross. But I want to talk about the finished work of the cross in relationship to to as you have believed. <clears throat> your belief has as much to do with what God does in your life because Jesus said that you have to believe. My friend John Patton, he says, only believe. In fact, it's not very often... Everybody that talks to me know that, that the way that they'll say, how are you today? And I say, if I was any better, I'd be twins. And almost everybody says, that's scary. <laughs> Except for a couple of people that say, aren't you triplets yet? And that's even scarier because I might be three times as tired instead of just twice as tired. But belief has to be based on what God has promised and what his will is, and nothing else, has to be based on, and, I, and I'm going to use uh, Bill. Almost forgot his name. I was so excited about him getting healed. Bill Manning. I'm going to use him for an example. Now here's a guy that was sitting here, and he's so short of breath for the entire conference that when worship time was going on he stayed sitting down because it was just too much to get up and get into worship and when everybody else is 
you know, they did some health deal where they was trying to teach us to do Tybo or Pilates or something so that we could stay in shape. And all that happened was I got punched two or three times by Corey Ross in the middle of it. And uh, so I didn't participate in that, but I did stand up. And, uh, and, and he didn't, but see what happened when the transition comes, it's because the belief level has to be so high that it's not moved by the fact that I'm short of breath. Because I'm going to promise you, when he touched him, and they were singing nothing but the blood, he was still sitting there going, <sighs> because he's short of breath. But the minute that he jumped up and started running, he was healed. Amen. And it's your belief in the finished work of the cross, what did Jesus say? It says, by his stripes... We were healed. Matthew 9, 18 through 28. While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died. Now, let me ask you something. What is the atmosphere of whether it's sickness, or it's death, or it's my finances don't look like they're going to make it, or, you know, we can look at all kinds of things that we can choose to worry about. What does that atmosphere do to us? The devil wants us to get pushed down where we're not going to get up. The devil wants us to get pushed down to a place that we can't believe out of that position. Now, I'm going to take a, a ruler, and, and I'm just going to give you a, a, a little background on this guy. He wasn't a Jew. Amen. Besides not being a Jew, he wasn't even like... Because he was a part of uh, the regime that the Jews or Israel was under at that time, which he was part of the Roman government. So he's stepping into a place that one, he doesn't even have a right because he's going to a Jew. Who really is under his rule. But he's going to ask him something. Now, see, sometimes we get in an atmosphere where things look so bad... It's like, you know, I know what the Bible says, but man, this is, or it could be, I feel so tough. I, I, I would imagine, I have no idea. You know, I, I know what shortness of breath feels like when I walk up the hill from my office to here and I walk pretty fast because I figured out that my clock was 12 minutes slow on the wall. And all of a sudden, I looked at my wrist and I went, Whoa, they're already started in church again. And I know what that kind of shortness of breath feels like, but I have no idea what it feels like to just, even to stand up is so bad that it's like, and the doctor says, you got now four more months to live. And sometimes we look, we look at that. You know, I'm using that for an example because that was a, a current thing. That, and I realize that you weren't there to see it. But I mean, this guy constantly was just going. <sighs> but when God says that my will is that you're healed by what? By the stripes that I already took 2,000 years ago. Then what is the choice? You know, here's this ruler that didn't even have a right. And here's what he says. My daughter has just died. And I'm going to be real honest with you. Most believers are going to just start throwing the dirt in. And here's a guy that's not even a covenant uh, child of God. You know, realizing that Jesus hadn't died yet and all that. But he wasn't even in the covenant that God had created. And he said this. He said, but come and lay your hand on her and she'll live. 
So Jesus rose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came, up, came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said in herself, if I can only touch the hem of his garment, I shall be well. But Jesus turned around when he saw her. He said, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. What is belief? What is faith? Belief is faith, and faith is belief. Faith means the confidence and the conviction that what God says is true and will come to pass. Does that mean that it's going to come to pass sometime later? If you're already dead, it doesn't matter. Because you're going to be in the presence of God. The Word's still going to work. It's still going to... What was the finished work of the cross? The finished work of the cross says that we'll heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. The finished work of the cross says that go into all the world, preach the gospel to every living creature, and these signs will follow those who believe. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. See, all of those things we can look at, and we looked at last week as the finished work of the cross. But we come into a position that we realize now, I really have to put it to work in my life so that uh, I can have exactly what it says. It's not something I'm going to stop right now and go, well, you know, it didn't work this time. It works every time. The name of Jesus will always do what the finished work of the cross says it was. Let's go on. Uh, verse 23. When Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, Make room, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. You ever walk into a place that uh, you'll speak the word and everybody goes, yeah, whatever. What does that do to your belief level? It's like, you know, the natural side of us or the thinking that our adversary has, as Jesus called him. We know him as the devil. The one that got thrown out of heaven. Jesus called him the ruler of this world. He wants us to think, maybe we've stepped out there just a little bit too far. Maybe we really shouldn't get over in that place because, I mean, after all, somebody says, uh, oh, we never did it that way before. You know, I mean, that might be God's will and maybe it's not. Anybody ever hear that kind of stuff? What does that do to our belief level? What is God's will? It's found between the covers of the Bible. And if it's in there, it is for today the same as it was written. Somebody asked me one day, said, what, what, do you, what do you believe? I believe that the Bible's true from the front to the back, and it's for today the same as the day that it was written. Because... It says the Word is living and it's powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And the Word will never change even after this world's gone. So if it'll never change after this world, world's gone, then is it the same today that it was yesterday? When Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then that means that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That doesn't change. That was a finished work of the cross. If it was for the very first church, then it's for this church because he said even to the end of the age, which means to the very end of time. But when the crowd was put outside, why did he put the crowd outside? You know what? You'll find out that when it comes time to pray for somebody, that if there's somebody standing there that doesn't believe it's true, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a statement that kind of... And, and, and I, I'm sorry if, if it offends somebody when this happens, but... When I'm praying for somebody, and I 
see people starting to reach out and touch him, I want to know that everyone that lays hands on him believes that it's going to happen. Because if they don't, I'm not afraid to say, you know, I don't want anybody to touch him right now. Because I want belief to be the thing that flows in that place. Why? Because your belief has everything to do with what you receive. The Bible says that if we speak to the mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, believe in our heart. Verse 24 says, when we pray, believe that we receive and will, might have it. We will have it. See, that was a finished work of the cross. When, when Jesus said, it's finished, he says, everything that I've said, everything that I've promised, it has been fulfilled and it's done. And so now all I have to do is I have to get into that place that I believe that the finished work of the cross was the thing that was going to cause it to come to pass in my life. He said to them, make room for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they ridiculed him and he put the crowd outside. When He went in and took her by the hand and the girl arose... Verse 26, and the report of this went out into all the land. When Jesus departed from there, I want to tell you one of, one of the things that's a finished work of the cross. We looked at it last week. I'm not ever going to quit saying this. Go. See, Jesus was constantly about his Father's business. I believe that one of the things that holds us back is that each one of us gets so busy with our daily chores, whatever those chores are. And every one of us has got our own chores, whether it's our job or, or, uh, uh, or the things that we have to do. Or going, man, I'm just believing that today I can pay my bills. Whatever it is, we can get so busy about that that we literally forget to look and see what it is that God wants us to do. And when I have a belief level that God wants me to be about his business. Say, Jesus said, I don't, uh, I'm, about, I, I'm about the Father's business. Even back when, uh, when his mother was looking for him when he was 12 years old, um, we, uh, we see that he was always in that position to be ready. So I want to tell you, be ready. Because God wants to do something through you, with you, and around you. It says, as Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into that house, the blind man, men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said, Yes, Lord. What part does belief actually play in that place? We find out that they, because they believed, they received their sight. Uh, in uh, John's rendition of, uh, or account of what we just read about the, the little girl, um, Jesus turned around to the ruler and he said, only believe. Which is where my friend gets his saying, only believe. You know, one of the things that is so encouraging about knowing and constantly reminding ourselves that all I have to do is believe to receive, but then comes that position that now what am I going to do with belief? I believe that I, if I ask each, each and every one of you in here, do you believe that... By his stripes you were healed. Each one of us would say yes. But do we receive? Are we ready to receive? See, these guys, when they said, these blind men, when Jesus said, do you believe? They expected to get something right then. It's not time to wait. It's time to say, I expect right now. I'm ready to receive. I remember... Uh, I listened today again. Uh, I didn't get to listen to all of it, but I listened to part of uh, John Ben Dixon again today. And, and uh, 
He said fullness, fatness, and abundance like never before. And I heard somebody say, I won't mention her name, but her initials are Kathleen, said, I receive. What is it that we're not ready to receive about the finished work of the cross? We need to position ourselves to receive. When Jesus paid for it, it was not only done, but I looked up the words uh, pass by. It was a supreme opportunity. So when Jesus paid, then we see that we have a supreme opportunity to receive everything that he paid for. And all I have to do is get ready to... You know, we got a lot of people that are on uh, antidepressants and, and, uh, and, I, and I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about in the world that... Uh, all we have to do is receive and not get in a place that we start dependent on something else. We live in a society today that we have so many things at our fingertips that we can start depending on instead of depending on the finished work of the cross. And I believe, and I'm not discounting medicine or or doctors, or and I'm not preaching against them, but I'm, but I'm telling you this. I'm telling you that we need to position ourselves to be ready to receive what Jesus paid for at the cross. Because our belief has everything to do. I, I looked at each place, and we're going to read a few places. Turn to Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. When he'd come to the other side of the country of the Genesites, there, he, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. Now if we go on there, we find out. Now what happened when they, when they came out of the tombs? Jesus was passing by. It didn't say he went the other way. It says that most people, could, or people couldn't go by him because they were so fierce. Well, we find out if you read on that he cast the demons out. Well, what happened? They got in a position that he... What was the finished work of the cross? The finished work of the cross was that we were going to cast out demons. Verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 30. Behold, two blind men sitting by the road. When Jesus said, now this isn't the same blind men that we read about a minute ago. When, and, two, and behold, two blind men sitting by the road. When Jesus heard, or excuse me, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. What did they do? They positioned their self. They realized that this was the Jesus that had been healing people, that had been given sight to the blind, that had raised the dead, and what did they do? They positioned their self because of their belief that they had heard. We have the greatest tool at our fingertips, and it's every one of you has one in your hand. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, Jesus uh, passed on from there and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office and he said to him, follow, him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. There was another opportunity. Went on in, in the next few verses, told him, he said, I'll, I'll, uh, he picked up the fishermen and he says, I'll make you fisher of men. Uh, Peter and John and James. Uh, turn to Mark chapter 1 verse 14 and 15. Mark chapter 1 verse 14 and 15. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. 
saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, believe in the gospel. I had to turn a page. What is the gospel? There's two things that have to do with the gospel. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And both of those are completely two uh, separate things, but they're tied together. The kingdom of God is at hand. Turn to Matthew chapter 10, verse 7 and 8. And if you've been here very long, you know that I've quoted this over and over and over. We should know down in our knower what it says. Does everybody know what it says? Anybody know what it says? I know, I see, I, I see it's on the screen already. As you go preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Luke 17, 20 through 21. Seventeen, twenty, and twenty-one. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, "The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you." So, what's the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven? Turn to John 14, verse 15. We're going to look at what the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is. Because he said, when you go preach, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. He told the Pharisees, he says, the kingdom of God is within you. The difference is, is that the kingdom of heaven is in you. And the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven live, comes out of you when you go into a place. If you're going to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, then the kingdom of heaven presence has come into that place because the kingdom of God lives in you. In John chapter 14, verse 15 through 21, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you a helper that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. A little while longer, and the world will see me no more, but because but you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will manifest myself to him. Uh, John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come and make our home in him. So we see right there how the kingdom of God lives inside of us because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit lives inside of us so that when we come into a place, and, I, and I'm going to tell you that one of the things that can move you so greatly in healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, raising the dead. See, that's a finished work of the cross. That as we went out, that it was, all we had to do is, there's a name above every name. At the name of Jesus. That every knee shall bow of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth. Every name 
that is named has to bow to the name of Jesus. I don't care what kind of name it is, what kind of sickness it is. It has to bow to the name of Jesus. That was part of the finished work of the cross. So when we look at that and we realize that because uh, Jesus has come in to live inside of us, then when I come into the room or come into the place or come into the hospital or come into wherever it might be, Last night it happened to be in Seguin, Texas, in the uh, in, uh, uh, Texas Ag Center is where the meeting was. When you come into the place, it is the presence of the kingdom of God is at hand. Because you have the kingdom presence of the living God inside of you. And when that place comes in, I have to realize that now I become a force that to be reckoned with because I carry a name that's above every name that when I say the name of Jesus that everything has to bow to that name and we come into that position that I realize all I have to do but you know what happens when you look and, and you I use the example of short breath or I remember uh, this comes to me a lot because I, I, uh, I look at our kids. Every one of our kids have been raised in the atmosphere that they don't expect anything less than when they say the name of Jesus that it'll just happen. One, one uh, little girl lays hands on her sister and expects right then she's just going to be healed just like that. Uh, uh, my grandson when his dad broke his leg, he walked by him, four years old, and said, Name of Jesus, and expected right then that it'd be healed. And that's the thing that we realize is I have a power that I'm a force to be reckoned with, and I'm not moved by what I see, what I think. But mo most of the time, I'm telling you, it's hard to build a house when you're in a storm. And so when we're in that position, what are we going to do? I'm going to. Say that again. Call it reinforcements. Sometimes reinforcements aren't available. So what are the reinforcements? The Holy Spirit is, what, what does the helper do? Comforts, teaches, brings things to our remembrance. But if he's going to bring them to our remembrance, what is my obligation to build belief? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it's not enough for me to teach for however long we do it about the finished work of the cross. If you don't put it in... And I'm not talking about listening to this teaching over and over and over and over again because you need to look at it in this church. You know that I wait till everybody turns in their Bible because I want you to see it in your own Bible so that you have the opportunity to remember where it is because all of a sudden the Holy Spirit's going to bring it up. Even if He doesn't bring up the address, you've read it and you go, yeah. Because most of the time when we leave church... Somebody goes, where are we eating? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, not where are we eating. I should have went over here or something, huh? <laughs> Most of the time, well, you know what? And that's the truth. Most of the time, thank you, that was good. Thought for a minute she messed me up, but she didn't really. Most of the time, about the time somebody gets up and goes, where are we eating? And then somebody says, what what they, what'd the preacher talk about today? Go, oh, yeah. <clears throat> um, um, uh, what, he talked about the name of Jesus. <laughs> Boy, that was a pretty good guess because that's probably going to always happen. Faith. faith. Yeah, I can't believe that I'd ever talk about faith. Bless I asked my, uh, prompted by my beautiful bride, I asked my youngest, 
or I should no, it wasn't either. It was David's youngest son, which is our youngest grandson in that part of the family. She says, ask him what he learned in Sunday school today. I talked to him Sunday night. And he goes, uh, uh, and I thought, boy, he's just like most adults. And his dad says, tell him your memory verse. And he could tell me that. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So when we call that up, then what happens? We've called up reinforcements because the Holy Spirit makes that real to us. But now I've got to make a choice whether I'm going to receive that or not. You know, it's really easy to give it to somebody else. It's really easy to lay hands on somebody else and believe it's going to happen for them. And then we go, well, how come you didn't receive? I mean, it was the name of Jesus. I'm just, I'm just looking at you, okay? I know that I'll go over here and preach for a minute to this chair. <laughs> but then when it's us, what do you do? Oh, man. Oh, I feel so bad. But praise God, I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. The finished work of the cross says you were already healed. So if you feel bad, what are you going to do? Sometimes, and y'all have heard me say, I have not been sick in 16 years, and I do not intend to get sick, but I've had several opportunities, and a couple of them just in the last couple weeks. Where it's, you know what? <laughs> you ain't coming to my house. Because I've got the name of Jesus, and I am not going to have that come on me again. Where years ago... When exactly the same thing that tried to attack me in the last couple of weeks, I'd have went, here it is, it's fall, I get cold every fall. Here it is, the spring, the weather's changing, I get a stuffed up nose and my throat hurts and my ears plug up. And So what are you going to do? You're going to make a choice. See, and sometimes it's a little harder than that because the doctor tells us something. I'm going to tell you what the doctor, what they told me, what the Lord told me to tell you today. He said, the doctor's not, he's wrong and you need to call it in the name of Jesus and, te and tell your body to come in line with the word. Amen. See, that's the choice that we make. We make that choice, what we're going to do with it. And how we're going to do it. I'm going to take the name of Jesus. I'm going to say it was finished at the cross. I, I wasn't kidding. When a doctor told me I had all the symptoms of prostate cancer, I fired a doctor because he didn't know. Can't live in my body. And I found a doctor that could tell me what the real thing was. The real thing was I didn't drink it. Boy, I got to where I drank enough water, I can't hardly stay away from the bathroom anymore because I'm not going to have that kind of symptoms. Under the new covenant... Since the finished work of the cross, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is available. The name of Jesus is available. See, the, the, the Holy Spirit only was in the prophets, the kings, and the priests in the Old Testament. But the kingdom of God presence wasn't inside of them. Because God didn't live inside of them. Jesus didn't live inside of them. And the Holy Spirit didn't live inside. He just anointed them. To prophesy, to judge, to do the things that they were supposed to do. But under the new covenant, Jesus, see, it was never said before in the Old Testament that the kingdom of heaven was at hand because the kingdom of God presence wasn't available to the believers. At that time was the Jews, God's people, still God's people. But today... It, we have the kingdom of God inside of us because the finished work of the cross, Jesus said, I will come and make my home inside of you and I will manifest myself to you. What does manifest himself to us mean? Make himself real. How does he make himself real? Do you know that you've got to say the name of Jesus for it to be real? And I'm going to tell you that things change, that everything that it, that name comes in contact with changes. I got a phone call today that I didn't take and I'm going to take care of tomorrow from the 
governor's religious uh, administrator in Delta State, Nigeria, and this is what he said. He said, I'm excited about everything that you're doing here and I can't wait to meet you. There's only one thing that I did there. It was the name of Jesus. And people got, were healed. That's not me. That's the name of Jesus. And everybody that'll use that name, that'll give that name out, it'll, it'll change everything that it comes in contact with. Because it's a finished work of the cross, not anything that we just, well, I hope this works. And I'm going to tell you, the first couple of times that I did it, it was like, Lord, you've got to show up now. But once you start, begin to use that name, i got to tell you something, I, and, and you all have heard me talk about this before, and Roddy probably doesn't want to hear this again, but <clears throat> every time somebody reaches down in a buck and shoots, I think of getting my hand shattered. And Roddy grabbing my hand... And uh, I guess I'm standing in front of the speaker. Robbie, Roddy grabbing my hand. And I'm thinking, man, you're hurting me. But he spoke the name of Jesus and it was immediately healed. And every time somebody reaches down in the buck and shoots, now I think, well, I really don't want to have to crawl over the buck and shoots and see that hand healed in the name of Jesus. But I'd sure do it. I just don't want him to have to go through that pain. Of course, Roddy's real handy. He looks at me and says, that wasn't your bowling hand, was it? <laughs> verse, uh, John chapter 14, verse 23. I'm going to read it first out of the New King James, and then I'm going to read it out of the Amplified. I think I must have read this one someplace before. No, I didn't either. <clears throat> Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. The Amplified says, Jesus answered, If a person really loves me, he will keep my word, obey my teaching, I'm going to stop right there for a minute. What did he teach? Well, if you'll confess your sin, I'll forgive you. No, that was John. John said, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, which is all part of the word. But Jesus said, do what my word says, and I'll love you. It was easy. You know, I remember something that, that and, and I have a, uh, pastor friend in Nigeria, or in uh, Uganda, that, uh, Pastor Hillary, he asked me a question the last day that I was in Uganda. He had come to, uh, to see me off to the, to the airplane. And we sat down and we were drinking a, there's a, a, a soda that we drink there called Stony. And uh, we were drinking a Stony. And he looked at me and he said, I've heard that in America that sometimes when people accept Jesus, that they still continue to drink and they still continue to smoke and they still continue to cuss and... He says, is that true? And I asked him a question. I said, uh, why do you ask me that? And he said, because in Africa, in Uganda, he said, when they accept Jesus, everything changes. And they just do what the Bible says. Well, you know, that's exactly what Jesus said. All he said was, if you do what I say, then... You are my children. So really what he said, and when he says, obey my teaching, the reason I stopped right there is because when he said, obey my teaching, he says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. That's what he taught us to do. He taught us the finished work of the cross is I paid for all these things, so use them. 
And my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our abode special dwelling place with him. John 14, 12. Jesus teaching. We ought to all know this one. Fact is, if you've been here long enough, I had this posted in the back of the tent up when it was on the hill. I'm going to read it out of the Amplified. It says, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, if anyone steadfastly believes in me, what steadfastly mean? I'm not moved. I'm not going to look to the right or the left. There is nothing that can move me. He will himself be able to do the things that I do and he will do even greater things than these because I go to the Father. See, that was a finished work of the cross because when Jesus went to the Father and he said, it is finished, he said, from this time on, greater works will the believers do because I'm going to the Father. And I'm not here, but I've already finished the work. And I paid for the work. And so you're going to do greater things. I don't hope that it'll happen anymore. The first couple of times I laid hands on somebody. And I'm going to tell you, the first time I laid hands on a, on a, a blind lady. I thought, man, Lord, you've got to show up now. Because I've been teaching these people all week. What the name of Jesus would do. And the Lord tells me, he says, I want you to show them. And the first one up there is a blind lady. That I didn't even know was blind. And she walked away seeing. I'm going to tell you, you just try to tell me that God won't restore blind eyes now. Come too late to tell me that. See, what happens is when we do that, and that's not about me. But it's about as you begin to take the finished work of the cross, there's nobody that can tell you that it won't work. You try to tell one of them kids in our kids' church that's been doing it that it doesn't work. You try to tell one of those little girls in kids' church that you don't get slain in the spirit and she'll tell you, I don't know what your slain in the spirit is, but I was just with God. See, what happens is when we operate in the finished work of the cross, then we experience that greater works than these, I'm going to do. It's a done deal. When Jesus bowed his head and, head and said, it is finished, he meant from this time on, greater works than I do. I expect that when I say the name of Jesus that it changes whatever I send it to. And the Bible says, and, you sh and, and I want you to. I want you to expect that. I want you to get in that. I want you to get into a place. Which means, if you expect it, then you can never again let some unbelief come out of your mouth. Because unbelief, oh, I feel so bad, but praise God, I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. You know what that is? You just made your faith statement first and your hope second. But when it is, bless God, I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. I walk, see, I don't believe in, I don't want to walk in healing. I want to walk in divine health because that's what God paid for. Because if I was healed, then I'm going to walk in divine health. And see, we've got to get, and, and, and I'm not talking about getting to a place overnight that you move from this place to that place way over there. But instead, put one foot in front of the other. You know, we know that before we run, we have to learn to put one foot in front of the other. And sometimes it's just that 
That simple with our faith. Put one foot in front of the other. Take the step that you can make today. I, I, I shared uh, a while back that in May our sound was so bad in the crusade. I didn't tell James that the sound was so bad. That's where his faith was. Was to believe for enough money to rent that sound system. And we did. And, it, and, and there was a lot of people that got saved, a lot of people that got healed, a lot of people that got filled with the Holy Ghost that week. But his faith went to another place. And now there's a brand new sound system because his faith got to that position to be able to believe that in. See, so sometimes you have to take one step before you can get to the place that you need to be. And that's the thing that trips so many people up and, and holds them back is... We try to take that giant step and we fall down because it was too far the first time. So take the faith step that you can. Just don't quit. Don't say, well, I'm not going to do anything because I can't make it all the way over there yet. We come into a position that we know that the name of Jesus will do anything we send it to. But I'm only going to take a step at a time till I get to the place that I can do it. That I can operate in it in a, the fullness that Jesus paid for. And it's okay if you can't operate to the fullness yet. Operate to the position that you can so that we can get to that place. Sometimes I realize that when uh, some of the things that I share and some of the things that we hear preachers preach, it sounds like I, there, there are some people that have been back to the same seminars, same teachings, listen to the same CDs over and over and over and over again because we hope we're going to get there someday. And until we do it, we're never going to get there. We've got to start to finish. And I can't just continue to listen to somebody else doing it and hope it gets on me. So I'm going to do just a little bit at a time. And be encouraged. If you fall down, everybody, I promise everybody, I listen to... Uh, I'm going to close with this. I have no idea what time it is. Praise God, I've still got a lot of time. <laughs> Listen to Gloria Copeland years and years ago. And uh, it was at a minister's conference that uh, she, she spoke. And she said, you know, uh, Kenneth was preaching prosperity and faith. And I had to keep my shoes on the floor because I had holes in the bottom of my shoes because I couldn't afford to buy new ones. But it didn't keep him from preaching prosperity and faith. Just because they didn't have enough money to buy a new pair of shoes. Or to get the ones they had sold. We have to remember that it's okay. To keep putting one foot in front of the other. Until you arrive at the place that you're getting there. As you've watched today. You've had the opportunity to hear the word preached. And as you apply that word, you'll get victory in your life. But it has to start someplace. It has to start first with a commitment to Jesus Christ as making him your Savior and then making him the Lord of your life. Paul said this in Romans 10, 8 through 10. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you and it's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Well, the word of faith that Paul preached is found in the next verses. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. For with a mouth confession is made unto salvation and with a heart one believes unto righteousness. So it goes like this. All you have to do is actually say, Jesus is my Savior and He is my Lord. So I'm going to invite you to say this with me this morning. Uh, and if you want to bow your head, you can bow your head. The Bible says that pray watching and so it's okay to keep your eyes open and, and watch. But let's say this together. Say, Father, I know that you sent Jesus to die for my sins. I confess those sins today. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of those sins and to come into my heart and be my Savior. And I commit today that I will make you the Lord of my life. Thank you for salvation today. In the name of Jesus, amen.
If you said that today for the first time, no matter what time of the day or night it is, uh, welcome to the family. Welcome to knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now from this day on, make Him the Lord of your life. And as you make Him the Lord of your life, you will find out what God can do in you and through you. Also, if you've watched this broadcast, we want you to know that you can become a partner with this ministry. As you become a partner with this ministry, some of the things that you've seen throughout this uh, presentation, uh, the buck outs and, and things like that, then you become a part of that kind of ministry. And there's many people that come to know Jesus. We have offices in Nigeria and Togo, have four churches in Nigeria, one in, in Togo, and uh, we want you to know that you become a part of each and everything that this ministry does when you become a partner. You can see the information right there on your screen so that you're able to become a covenant partner with us. And as you do, we want you to know that we pray over each and every one of your offerings so that God will multiply it back to your hands according to his word. His word says in Luke 6, 38, that he gives back, pressed down, shaken together, running over to make room for more. The New Living Translation says whatever measure you use in giving large or small, it'll be used to measure what is given back to you. So we want you to know that God loves you He'll take care of you and he'll multiply the seed that you sow in this ground with this ministry. Remember that Jesus is Lord and Jesus loves you and so do we.